In February 1962, I made the maiden voyage of French Lines SS France from Le Havre to New York. Nobody in their right mind crosses the Atlantic by ship in February except someone who enjoys ship travel as much as I do. But even for me, this was a bit too much. By the time we were in mid-Atlantic, we were hit by 80-foot seas. Huge waves were crashing over the ship's funnels. In order to shave, I had to brace myself with my foot against the bathroom sink and my back against the wall. In the grand salon, the orchestra was playing, but dancing was impossible. Most of the entertainment programs were canceled for the entire voyage. By October of that year, I was due for another vacation. Again, I opted for a shipboard voyage, but this time I had decided to head south through the calm Caribbean and southern Atlantic. I picked the American liner of more McCormick lines, the SS Brazil, for a 30-day sailing to Rio de Janeiro, Montevideo, and Buenos Aires. My girlfriend Audrey accompanied me to New York. A bottle of champagne and some canapes were compliments of the line were waiting for us in my cabin. We shared a few toasts before the announcement came, all visitors ashore, the SS Brazil is about to sail. We said our goodbyes and Audrey departed. I went on deck and there she was on the pier waving goodbye as the ship slowly backed into the river and the band played Anchors Away. As we sailed down the Hudson River, we met the beautiful SS United States pulling out of her pier. And although 10 years old, she looked brand new. For a brief time, we sailed beside her until we reached the Verrazano Narrows Bridge where she took off like a sports car for her trip across the Atlantic to England and France. She was the fastest passenger liner ever built. We dropped our harbor pilot at the Ambrose Lightship and headed south along the Jersey Shore for the Caribbean. A fresh breeze greeted us, followed by a glorious sunset. This was the Brazil's first sailing following her annual dry docking and overhaul. She was spanking clean inside and out. I returned to my cabin to freshen up for dinner. The first night at sea is informal, but still a jacket and tie are suitable. I had been assigned the chief engineer's table, Ed Mannion, a very handsome, charming gentleman and the lady's favorite officer. Dinner was excellent, but we began to notice a bit of unusual movement as dessert was served. The ship's orchestra was to give a concert in the lounge following dinner that night. Dancing in the night clip had been canceled because we learned that we were heading into a hurricane. The ship's movement had become considerably more noticeable as we sat down to hear the concert. Since the crew, including the orchestra, had not been to sea for several weeks, they had not acquired their sea legs yet. One by one, members of the orchestra began disappearing as the ship now began to roll and pitch. The motion continued to become more violent until there was only the pianist left on stage. Even he had to finally leave as the crew came in to batten down the piano to keep it from rolling off the stage. The motion for the next two nights was worse than anything I encountered on the SS France. Fortunately, I do not get seasick. The weather improved as we sailed into the Caribbean and made our first port of call, St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. There, we learned of another crisis the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was having cocktails with some fellow passengers on the pool deck while the captain turned on the ship's speaker system so that we could hear President Kennedy's warning to the Soviet Union and to Cuba. Rumors were being spread around that we were going to return to New York because of the danger of a submarine or an attack from the air. As I got up to dress for dinner, I assured my newfound friends that everything was going to be all right. No one would attack a peace-loving cruise ship. That said, I headed for my cabin. On the way, I happened to notice all the windows along the promenade deck had been blacked out. 
and when I entered my cabin, my nerves were not soothed when I saw black out discs inserted into my two portholes. Well, that night we sailed from St. Thomas and headed south for our next port of call, Rio de Janeiro. From then on, it was pure fun. 27 of the happiest days of my life, winning the dance competition with my Charleston, winning the talent show with my rendition of Moon River, King Neptune's welcome ceremony of crossing the equator for the first time. Playing musical chairs with my newfound Brazilian friends. Not too successful with the limbo. Cheating at the limbo. And incomparable dining with my shipboard pals. Not to mention the magic of Rio, the beauty of Montevideo, and the sophistication of Buenos Aires. Plus, rescuing my new best buddy, Chief Banyard, from the clutches of a female blonde who became infatuated with him, a happily married man with a 12-year-old daughter. Chief Banyard's wife sent me a Christmas card that year, thanking me for keeping her husband faithful. The sea and ships have been a very important part of my life. <laughs> I am a true Pisces.